Imagine you're Willie Phillips, the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, and you know the grid is not up to what's coming. Fossil fuel plants shutting down, wind and solar farms cropping up across the landscape, demand for electricity increasing for data centers, EVs, and heat pumps. Transmission congestion is growing, and it's going to keep growing. And utilities aren't building nearly enough transmission, and what they are building isn't necessarily in the right place. You can point to a score of places on the map where they're headed towards an unstable grid, and nobody is doing a damn thing about it. You can also point to another score of locations where a transmission line would unlock renewables and lower electricity bills. You feel like Cassandra, the Trojan priestess, fated to utter true prophecies but never to be believed. How do you get utilities to see the chaos ahead and prepare for it? Today we're going to talk about FERC Order 1920, which is their attempt at doing something. Spoiler alert, it's definitely a good thing, but it is certainly not enough to solve the problem. But Order 1920, along with other recent FERC reforms, may be the best that FERC can do with the authority they have. FERC can't build transmission lines, nor can they force someone else to build them. But they do write the rules, so they're hoping that better rules lead to a better grid. In 2015, FERC Order 1000 created transmission planning regions, seen here, and laid out the rules for regional planning of transmission. Many of these regions were pre-existing regional transmission organizations, or RTOs, or independent system operators, or ISOs, which are nonprofits that operate the grid within their regions but do not own the transmission lines. In the rest of the country, the transmission line owners operate their lines, but there is still an organization just for planning. The exception is Texas, where the grid is isolated from the rest of the country and not subject to FERC's rules. The purpose of these transmission planning regions was to coordinate where power lines needed to be built and who would pay for them, based on the beneficiaries. For instance, if a line was built connecting a wind farm to a utility 100 miles away, crossing the territory of three utilities, only the customers receiving the power would pay for the transmission line, not those whose territory the line crossed. The quality of planning done in these regions was hit or miss. Since it takes 20 years to build a major transmission line, you'd think they'd plan with a time horizon of at least 10 years. But some of these plans only looked a few years ahead. They would argue there's too much uncertainty to plan much further out. But that's only partially true. Often power plants telegraph their closure far in advance. For instance, the Centralia Power Plant in Washington State signed an agreement in 2011 to close in 2025. The Vautel Nuclear Power Plants, Units 3 and 4, started construction in 2009 and were completed in 2023. That's plenty of warning to be included in long-term planning. FERC's hope was that planning would lead the utilities to realize they needed more transmission and to start building it. They were also hoping the analysis behind the planning could be leveraged to improve the process of granting access to the grid, which is called an interconnection. Basically, none of this happened. Over 10,000 projects representing 1.3 terawatts of generator capacity, which is about the amount of generation capacity on the grid today, and 680 gigawatts of storage, which is about 20 times the amount on the grid, are actively seeking interconnection. And interconnection wait times are growing and are now typically longer than four years. In 2023, FERC issued Rule 2023 that should improve the interconnection process. But that's beyond the scope of this video. If you'd like me to cover that, let me know in the comments. We just weren't getting quality planning out of Order 1000, so FERC has updated the planning process with Order 1920, building for the future through electrical regional transmission planning and cost allocation. And in the geeky world of the electrical grid, this is a big deal. I've attended several webinars about 1920, and I don't even do this for a living. Rob Granlick, founder and president of Grid Strategies, summarized the order during one of those webinars as, plan for the future with the best available information, select the best plan for consumers, and allocate the costs according to the benefits. 
which sounds simple enough, but when you get lawyers, politicians, and bureaucrats involved in looking for loopholes, it's important to get as detailed as you can without a judge throwing it out for having too much detail. Order 1920 requires planning with a 20-year horizon by all regional transmission planning organizations with the involvement of all of the stakeholders. The plan must be updated every five years. Given that power plants and transmission lines can take 10 to 20 years to build, it's kind of shocking that this wasn't already happening. It requires considering grid-enhancing technologies and reconductoring that I've spoken about previously. These are very cost-effective options to improve the grid, so it's pretty obvious they should be included. The plan must consider multiple scenarios and select the best for consumers based on seven criteria, most of which translate to keep your costs down and your efficiency up. But I'll highlight just two of them. First, Reduce congestion due to transmission outages. We've talked about how grid-enhancing technologies can reduce congestion, even during unusual events. And this requirement seems to be pushing that. Secondly, mitigation of extreme weather events and unexpected system conditions. This is why planning is needed. You can have a grid operate fine most of the time, and then something weird happens in Ohio and the whole Northeast loses power. Or Texas has a cold snap and 4.5 million people lose power and over 200 people die. FERC 1920 describes the process for transmission lines that cross the seam separating planning regions and how the regions should work together in a process similar to how utilities work together inside the planning regions. Anyone who has watched my videos will not be surprised to learn how important I think this is because it's required to build a metagrid on a national scale. One of the challenges is that regional planning authorities can create a plan, FERC can approve it, but if the state regulators don't like it, then it's not going to happen. Order 1920 creates a space for the planning authority to collaborate with the state, but that only improves the odds that the state will approve the plan. If you've watched my previous episode on national interest electric transmission corridors, you know that there's a chance that FERC can override the state, but only in 10 regions des designated by the DOE. FERC Order 1920 lays out guidelines that should improve planning but it can't require good planning. And FERC has no authority to require or even encourage the plan to be followed. Will the reforms coming out of FERC over the last couple of years lead to a better grid? I suspect so. Will it lead to the U.S. having the grid needed to meet our decarbonization and reliability goals? It's possible. If the 50 states and 3,000 utilities and 13 planning regions work together in good faith to support the common good, and keeping the lights on depends on it. If you've learned something, please like and subscribe. You can also support the channel by buying me a coffee. And if you want to catch any of my episodes on transmission, you can follow this link. And please share this video with anyone who you think will enjoy empathizing with FERC Chairman Willie Phillips.